Today we're going to cover section three and we're going to cover the midpoint and the distance formulas. But before we can learn those formulas, we're first going to define what a midpoint is. And a midpoint is a point that divides the segment into two congruent segments. So in this picture, if M is the midpoint of JK, then that tells us that JM is equal to MK, or you could also say that JM is congruent to MK. So JM is located right here, and MK is right here. So again, you can show here that the JM, the length of JM is three, the length of MK is three, so I know the two segments are equal, which also makes them congruent. Now, one thing to remember is if you have a picture of a segment, and if I place a point right here, smack dab, which appears to be in the middle, A, B, C, I cannot assume that B is the midpoint. The only way that I will know that B is the midpoint is if they give me numbers on the segments like they did up here. So I could have put two and two here to show that AB is the same size as BC. Then I can say that B is the midpoint. Or they might also, instead of putting numbers, put in the congruency marks. So without values of the length of those segments or without congruency marks, <coughs> I can't tell for sure if B is the midpoint. The only thing that we're ever going to be able to assume in this course, and this will come at the end of the chapter, is when you have a picture of a straight line, you can state that this is a straight line, and it's also called a straight angle, and it measures 180 degrees. Anything else you can never assume about how big it is, okay? But you can always know that this is a line and that it measures 180 degrees when we talk about angles coming up at the end of the chapter. Next thing we're gonna do is define what a segment bisector is. So a segment bisector could be a point, it could be a ray, it could be a line, it could be a line segment, or even a plane. And what this bisector is going to do is it's going to intersect the segment at its midpoint. So in this particular picture, we have segment AB, and we can see that CD is bisecting that segment because it's hitting at the midpoint because we can see that AM is congruent to MB because they both have the same congruency marks. So as soon as you see a segment that's split into two congruent pieces, then you know that that point right there in the middle is the midpoint and that segment has been bisected. When we have a bisector, it doesn't necessarily have to cut through. So for example, if I have another segment here, and let's call it XY, and let's say I put W here, and I'll put Z up here. If I have congruency marks on this, this tells me that XY was bisected because I can see that it's got two equal pieces, that w, XW is gonna be congruent to WY, and it was bisected by Ray WZ. So it doesn't have to cut all the way through the segment to be bisected. As soon as you see that either at a point or a ray or a line segment or a line, as soon as it splits that segment into two congruent pieces, 
That's how I can tell that it was bisected. So actually WZ is the bisector. Let's see, let me change this word. So, um, so XY was bisected by WZ. This example, so this is a, a skateboard design. So it's the top of a skateboard. And it says that VW bisects XY at point T. So VW is right here. And it's bisecting XY at point T. Now, if you zoom into the picture, they were actually kind of nice here. They gave us congruency marks on these segments. So I can tell that since it was bisected, that it creates two congruent pieces. So that tells me that XT right here is gonna be congruent to YT. And they gave me the length or the measurement of XT and XT is 39.9 centimeters. So that tells me that YT is also 39.9 centimeters. So if they ask me to find the length of the whole thing, XY, all I need to do is take 39.9 plus 39.9. Now I could have also times it by two. Um, either way, it doesn't matter. So once I add this, I get 79.8 centimeters is the length for XY. So if this were a word problem that you would get on the quiz or in the homework tonight, this is all you have to do is realize when something is bisected, it creates two congruent pieces. So here we would just double it to get the length of the entire um, length of that skateboard, XY. Now, just to show you a little introduction of what's to come as far as writing proofs, I could turn this word problem into a proof. And I'll show you what a proof is gonna look like. You will not have a proof on the quiz. This will be coming up later on. But when we write proofs, you're gonna create two columns. You're gonna create a statement column, and then you're gonna create a reason column. Now the statements are gonna be based off of something that's given to you, um, or different rules and definitions and theorems and postulates. And then the justification or the reason will be the name of that theorem or the name of that definition. So let's say I give you the information that point T is, a mid, is the midpoint of XY and that XT equals TY, which equals 39.9 centimeters. And that's basically what they told us in the problem. And that reason would be our given information. Then from there, if they ask me to prove that XY equals 79.8, this would be, so they're gonna give you a proof statement and a given. So what I need to do is somehow get this given to show that that XY does equal that. So my next statement could be showing my segment addition postulate. So show that XY plus XT or equals XT plus TY. And this would be my segment addition postulate. 
And again, if you want to abbreviate it as SAP, then you don't have to write out those three words. Then my next step would be to take what was given to me, the values of X, T, and TY, and substitute them in. So I'm gonna take what X, T, and TY equal and put them in here, 39.9 plus 39.9. And that reason would be called substitution. Next, I'm going to add, and I would get 79.8. This reason would either be add, or you could also say simplify. And now, <clears throat> because my last statement here was what I was asked to prove, I'm done. So this is just a little preview of what's to come um, as far as writing two column proofs. Again, for the quiz on Thursday, you will not be writing a proof, but this will be coming up later on. The second example says that point M is the midpoint of VW. Find the length of VM. So this is where I'm gonna use my knowledge of the definition of a midpoint. And I know that the definition of a midpoint tells me that the midpoint splits the segment into two congruent segments. And what was nice is they had the congruency mark here in the picture. Chances are on a test or a quiz, I wouldn't include those congruency marks. So you would need to know that VM is congruent to MW just based on the fact that they told you that M was the midpoint. So because I know that these two segments are congruent, I can set them equal to each other. So I will set what VM equals, which is 4X minus 1, set that equal to 3X plus 3. I now need to solve for X, and then plug it back in to get the length of VM. So I'm gonna subtract X minus one equals three. I'm gonna add one, X equals four. Now the question did not ask for X. It wants us to find the length of VM so now I need to take what X equals and substitute it back to the expression for VM. So the expression for VM was the 4X minus 1. I'm going to replace X with 4. I'm going to multiply and then subtract. So the length of VM is 15. Now, be very careful when you're taking your test and your quiz and when you're doing the homework that you clearly read what the question is asking for. A lot of times students will stop at this point and tell me X equals four and think that's the answer. So make sure you read carefully. If it just said find X, you would have stopped there. But more than likely, most of the time, I'm gonna ask you for the length of a segment or maybe an angle measure. So you will have to take that next step and plug it back in. Now, one way that I can easily make different versions of a quiz or a test is by just changing one little letter or one little sign. So for example, on one version of the test, I could ask, give me the length of VM. On another version of the test, I could be asking for VW. And remember, VW would have been the whole thing. So you would have had to have gone back and add 15 plus 15 to get the length of the whole thing. So be very careful. 
and watch what I'm asking for. Now we're gonna learn the midpoint formula. And you might look at that and think, oh my goodness, that looks kind of complicated. So for the midpoint formula, the answer after you plug in the numbers is gonna be an order pair. So what we're gonna do is notice they got all these little ones and twos, but all these little subscripts here on these order pairs are just like labels. So for point A there, X1, Y1, think of this as just like order pair number one. And then for point B, the X2, Y2, think of this as order pair number two. They're just little labels. So for the formula, you are going to take the two X's, the X out of one point, and add it to the X of the other order pair, and then divide by two. For the Y's, the same thing. So the answer to this calculation will give you the X of your midpoint, and then the answer to this calculation will give you the Y of your midpoint. And again, it's gonna be an order pair. So let's go ahead and try an example. So example three. Now, they're asking us to find the coordinates of the midpoint. So let me go ahead and refresh and show you what the formula is. Remember it's X1 plus X2 divide by two, Y1 plus Y2 divide by two. And remember, this will give you the X of the midpoint and this will give you the Y of the midpoint. So what I'm gonna do is go up to my problem because they gave me the two endpoints. I'm gonna label point R as my order pair number one. I'm gonna call this X1, Y1. And then for point S, I'm gonna call this X2, Y2. Honestly, it doesn't matter what you label the order pairs as. So now what I'm gonna do is plug these four numbers into the formula. So I'm gonna replace X1 and X2. So I'm gonna take this one and add it to the four, because that'll be my X1 and X2. So I'm gonna do one, one plus four divided by two. And then I'm gonna get the Y's. So Y1 and I'm gonna add it to the Y2. Come over here, Y1 negative three y2 is positive 2 divide by 2. So now I need to do the math. Four pl uh, 1 plus 4 is 5 over 2. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1 over 2. This is our midpoint of Rs. This would be point M. Now, I'm okay with you leaving it like that. However, if you were graphing this, I highly recommend that you turn five over two into either a decimal, and you could do the half into a decimal, or you could even make it a mixed number. So on the quiz, I would accept any one of these three answers. Once we start the online homework, be very careful. They may ask you, enter your answer as a decimal, enter your answer as a mixed number. So when you start the online homework, if you put one of these and they've told you specifically in the instructions how to enter it, it could mark it wrong. So um, for the quiz though, because it's free response, I would accept any one of these three was calculating the midpoint when you were given two endpoints. The next slide, they're going to ask us to calculate an endpoint. So they're going to give us the midpoint already calculated, 
and one endpoint. We're still using the same formula, but we're working backwards. So again, the formula, if you recall, is x1 plus x2 divide by 2. Remember, this gives you the x of the midpoint. Then to find the y of the midpoint, you add the y's and divide by 2. And again, remember, you would take these two, and it forms that order pair. So let's go ahead and label what was given to us. So they gave us the midpoint. So this is going to be my x of the midpoint and the y of the midpoint. And then this endpoint over here, I'm just going to make it order pair number one, the x1, y1. So really what I'm solving for is x2, y2, which will be an endpoint. So k is going to be the x2, y2 in the formula. So let's fill in our numbers. So my x1 is going to be 1. I don't know x2. Divide by 2. And I set it equal to the, y, the x of the midpoint. Then the formula for the y, I'm going to take the y1, which is 4, add it to the y2, divide by 2, and set it equal to the y of the midpoint. Now I need to solve both of these algebraic equations. So my goal is to get this x sub 2 or x2 by itself. So what I do is I multiply both sides by 2 to clear the fraction. That cancels. And now I'm left with at 1 plus x sub 2 equals 4. Subtract 1. And the x of my endpoint is 3. And now I'll do the same thing up here. Clear the fraction. 4 plus y sub 2 equals 2. Subtract 4 to get the y by itself. And the y of my endpoint is negative 2. So my point k is the order pair 3, negative 2. And if you looked at the graph, you can clearly see that this k point is the order pair 3, negative 2 from the graph. However, on the quiz, I'm not going to give you the picture. I'm just going to give you the coordinates. Distance formula. You need to memorize this. Again, we've got two order pairs. Order pair number one, x1, y1. Order pair number two, x2, y2. And then you just plug them in. So now instead of, subtract, of adding the x's, I subtract them. So I subtract the x's and square them. Subtract the y's, square them, and then add those two numbers and then square root it. We are doing this without a calculator. You will have to know how to break down square roots by hand. And I'm going to show you what I mean. You should have learned this in Algebra 1, but I'll quickly give you some examples. Um, let's also back here. Notice in the picture, when we did this homework before, all of the questions were either horizontal or vertical lines. Now, to use the distance formula, that's going to be to find the length of these diagonal lines. So when it's horizontal or vertical, you can just count the boxes. But it's when it's diagonal, you got to use the formula. Now, some of your pre-algebra teachers might have taught you Pythagorean theorem. You could also do it because te technically that purple line is the hypotenuse. In our textbook, we do not learn Pythagorean theorem till chapter 9. However, if you choose, if you remember how to do it, you can. But again, we're using the distance formula. Head and try an example. Now, so here we go. The distance between two points. I'm going to label this one as my x1, y1. And this one will be my x2, y2. I'm plugging it into this formula. 
x2 minus x1 squared, y2 minus y1 squared, and it's all under the square root. So let's fill it in. So 7 minus 13 squared plus 10 minus 2 squared, all under the radical. Subtract, subtract. I'm now going to square 36 plus 64, add them. I get the square root of 100, and the distance between those two points is 10. When it's a perfect square, it's nice and easy. The next example is not a perfect square, and I'm going to show you how to break it down. So this will be my x1, y1 x2, y2, plug it in. So it'll be 4 minus 2 squared plus negative 1 minus 3 squared, all under the radical, 2 squared, negative 4 squared, 2 squared is 4, negative 4 squared is 16. Add them. 20 is not a perfect square. I need to leave this in simplest radical form, so I need to do a factor tree. So I'm gonna break this down. Doesn't matter what I start with. I can either do four times five or two times 10. Break it down, two and two, and then five. Once I get prime numbers, I look for pairs. I have a pair of twos, this becomes a perfect square, comes out of the radical, the five stays underneath, it doesn't have a pair. So the square root of 20 in simplest radical form is two square root five. Okay, I'm gonna add like two more examples just to show you how to break down radicals. So for example, if you have the square root of 75, you would do a factor tree because 75 is not a perfect square. So you'd break it down to 25 times three. You could still break the 25 into five times five. Pair of fives, five comes out, three stays underneath. Same thing with the 98, if I wanted to do that. I could break this down into 49 times two, and then keep breaking it down till it's prime. Now I have all prime factors, Look for a pair, pair of sevens, seven comes out, two doesn't have a pair, so that would be the simplest radical form for 98. Let me do one more quick one. Let me do 48. Now 48 has lots of factors. You could either do two times 24, three times 16, four times 12, six times eight. Let me do six times eight. I'm gonna keep going till it's prime. And again, it doesn't matter what you initially start with. You still get the same final answer. And then this is prime, still bring it down. This is prime, bring it down, and then break the four one more time. Now I go back and look for pairs. Sometimes there's more than one pair. This gives me a pair. Then these twos make a pair. So a two will come out of there. This poor little three doesn't have a pair, he stays underneath. Now anything that comes out of the radical, you will multiply together. So two times two is four, and then radical three stays behind. So be able to leave all your answers in simplest radical form.